Hi everyone, we're gonna give it a few seconds to let everyone flow in and then we will begin. Hi and welcome to our Restaurant Rapid Recovery webinar. A little housekeeping before we begin. Everyone is muted during the webinar. All webinars are recorded and sent to all attendees after the webinar is concluded along with a copy of the slides. There will be Q&A at the end of presentation today, but please feel free to ask your questions during the webinar by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Once the presentation concludes, I will ask the questions presented in the Q&A box. I may not get to everyone's questions, but we will do our best. If we don't get to your questions, please call 800-616-7232. I will also put this number in the chat box. Over to you, Greg. Thank you, Hannah. Welcome back, everybody. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We want to remind you that if you are joining for the very first time, you will receive an email after this uh, panel discussion that will give you the information from today's show as well as the two previous weeks. Um, we are very excited about week three today. Um, as you remember, our panel includes myself, Greg Bell, Mark Elliott, Bill Waldo, Steve Gostin, Jay Alice. Tom Bruce is away this week and will be joining us next week. The goal of this panel discussion is to make the restaurant tour and their customer feel comfortable and safe to recapture the trust in the dining experience in the customer. Please understand we are, we are making recommendations only. We're offering resources, not solutions. Our panel of SBDC consultants want to help you develop a plan that fits your ideas and goals. We will not be discussing funding at any level of the federal, state, county, or city rules and policies during the recovery, reopening. Things that we have found, three different types of customers that we're looking to bring into our restaurants again. The ambitious and ready, you, I'm sure you've seen those people already. Uh, the aware customer, but optimistic, they're willing to try you, but they are gonna be watching to see what you do. And cautiously waiting clients. These customers are waiting at home to see what happens before they decide to venture out. When you're considering your plan, make sure that you consider all three types of your customers. We have many resources for you today. The SBDC is our primary resource. We're here to answer your questions and help. We have our reopening guideline, which will be included in the email. We have quotes from the, the CDC and from the National Restaurant Association. Today, we are going to talk about customer experience with direction. How do we communicate with our customers? And then we're very excited to talk about supply chain management with our very special guest, Brett Berglund, president of Cisco LA. So, uh, we didn't get a lot of questions from last week. If anybody had any questions, they could ask them now in the chat and we'll definitely get to those. Um, we're finding different things that work and different things that don't work. And we want to hear from you as to what you discovered. So speaking about customer experience with directions, greeting directions is important to guide your customer into your establishment. We put down here a virtual embrace. Obviously we're not going to hug our customers when they come back, but we need to make them as welcome as possible and as informed as possible. Remember, we're going after that customer perception as well as their trust. So they're looking for non-contact efforts to improve safety, creative perception ideas. What can you and your staff display, model, or do to give the customer perception that they're doing a great job? Um, one of the ideas we heard just a little while ago was 
in um, a restaurant, they had a timer set for every 30 minutes. And when the timer went off, all the employees stopped what they were doing and washed their hands. Great idea, excellent perception to the customer. How safe does the customer feel when they see a timer go off and everybody stops what they're doing and washes their hands? Great idea. Little things that go a long way are just that. Little things that they see that you've invented or brought in that help them understand what they can do. If you have lines painted on the floor, you have decals on the floor, you have barriers, barricades, things like that, it's not welcoming. You need to have barriers, you need to have direction, but it can't just be a printed poster or written on the door. It has to be something that comes from your employees and yourself that helps them understand what to do and how to do the new brand of your restaurant. What do they do to order? What do they do to pay? Where do they queue in line? Where do they wait safely? All these things are very important that they be instructed upon uh, before they enter. And while they're there, they have to be welcomed and, and greeted and explained to over and over again what to do. So I hope that you can understand more of the customer experience through direction. We want to hear from you. Um, I think that everybody's been out and about and looking at other restaurants that have opened. Certainly want to want to see what they're trying out. I'm pretty sure that everybody's seen excellent jobs of reopening and maybe not so excellent jobs of reopening. Maybe things that were missed and maybe things that people rushed to open without considering what they wanted to see. So um, we want to really talk to you and, and you know, we can all print signs or make signs or post policies in our opening windows, cover up our restaurant with scotch tape and, and eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper. Uh, is there a better way to communicate to your customer? I mean, all the way from the street back into the restaurant. What's the best way to communicate to your customer? Do you have new opening banners? Do you have now open banners? Do you have um, communication online with social media, things like that, to get them to come there? To purely explain to them, hey, we're open, we're back. We need to see you. All of these procedures reflect your brand and your preparedness to open and give direction. So later on, we want to hear from you about how you communicate with your customers and what's the best way uh, for us to communicate with ours. I'd like to move into supply management change and bring on our very favorite guest uh, today. Brett Berglund has uh, agreed to come on and talk about the industry in general. Um, I'm curious, how many of you have reached out to your suppliers? How many of you have gotten their directions on what's going on and what's happening in the supply chain? What have you found out? Brett is here to talk about that today. So I'm going to bring him in. Good morning, Brett. Good morning, how are you? I'm doing just fine. Thank you so much for joining us. It's just, I'm very excited as you can tell that you're here today. Um, <laughs> can you give us an overview of what you've experienced in, in, in these last months with Cisco? Yeah, sure, you know, and for starters, thanks for, thanks for having me on. You said uh, uh, special guest. I think I'm the only guest today, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess that that's special, but um, yeah, you know, just, uh, um, you know, kind of before I dive into that question, uh, you know, I just, um, just want to say that, um, you know, obviously these have been uh, incredibly challenging times for, for all of us. So, um, you know, myself personally, um, you know, what I'm speaking through kind of today is just my experience in, in the industry. And I certainly work for um, a, a local company here as well, a national company, but you know, I started as a, um, as a restaurant, uh, well, I, I started as a cleanup boy, like a lot of people did in this industry, and, you know, spent a dozen years as an operator and an owner, um, and then uh, about the last 25 years with Cisco as well. So a lot of experience in different things, and, um, you know, one of the things that I think the COVID crisis has taught us is that um, uh, we certainly never stop learning, and, um, you know, there, there's nobody on this webinar today that's experienced this. Nobody. I don't. Doesn't mean you're in No. No natural disaster or anything has been anything like this. So um, 
I think we're all, um, you know, uh, together on this, that we're, we're learning and we're getting better. So, um, you know, uh, to go back to your question, I mean, I think, I think what we had to change the most um, at the get-go was, was kind of similar to what everybody else had to, to deal with. And just a little bit of background from the distributor standpoint is, um, you know, this thing happened at uh, the drop of a dime overnight for all of us. And uh, uh, many of you uh, shut your doors in, in your businesses right away. And then uh, at, at Cisco, it's a little bit different scenario. I was talking to the guys earlier, you know, uh, in our business model, um, which is very similar to a restaurant business model, is you try and buy as much product that you're going to go um, uh, sell to your customers. Same thing that we do. And if we're doing it perfectly, we buy the perfect amount and we ship out the perfect amount. Um, that's obviously not obtainable. And which is why we carry inventory, just like you do in a restaurant. You don't know exactly what you're going to sell. You budget and you prepare for it. So the biggest challenge that we ran into from a distributor standpoint was our product. And a lot of people don't understand this. A lot of our product takes days and weeks to get here. And so a lot of product was already on the road and, and on, its, uh, on its way here. So when everybody stopped ordering the product, our inventory actually started to um, climb uh, uh, significantly because we weren't moving out the product. So there was a long process of changing um, uh, and right sizing our inventories uh, and working through that. You all had to deal with that in your own locations. If uh, you had product that you, you couldn't uh, sell, as, as I always said, you got to sell it or smell it. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. And we all worked through that. And then we kind of went through this little period of unknown time and then just like that, you know, every county started opening up left and right. Um, LA County, you know, was uh, looking to be one of the last counties to open, projecting July 4th, and you know, they they announced their opening, um, you know, a week and a half ago. Uh, and then, of course, we've we've gone through this uh, horrific uh, situation and, and the protests that have been going on. So, um, you know, we're really just getting back up and and going, and it's that next stage that we're really starting to enter now. Um, an amazing uh, task at hand, I'm sure. I was curious, this is, you know, you talk about your inventory and I know you have a vast amount of storage and refrigeration and freezers and that kind of thing. But what was going through my mind is your inventory, you explained that your inventory orders were still coming in. Um, what, what did you do with your perishables? What, what happened with perishables? I'm sure that was difficult to manage. Yeah, you know, um, you know, obviously, um, uh, just like a restaurant tour, right? You try and you know, you stop placing the orders that you can, and so we did, uh, we did that, but we had product on hand. So, um, you know, we never closed. Um, we were certainly an essential, uh, um, you know, um, supplier partner in in the industry. A couple things, uh, you know, we did a lot of pivoting to uh, working uh, more retail. Um, to move some of our products. So we, you know, we're much more of a food service, you know, distributor, obviously, but we did some, um, some retail work. And then there's probably some uh, Cisco customers on here as well. We did a lot of work around what we called uh, pop-up shops, pop-up retail and different things where we were helping customers um, uh, transform their business from, you know, a dine-in facility to, um, you know, either a takeout if they weren't already doing that or enhancing their takeout facilities, um, or doing these pop-up retail environments, and so this helped us, you know, certainly move um, product through the uh, um, through the organization and into the community. And then we also stepped up uh, and and really made some very strong commitments as a corporation to what we were going to donate um, to meals and feeding the hungry, uh, including uh, not only product but some monetary donations that we did through um, our campaign um, uh, that went to uh, No Kid Hungry last month. So I'm um, pretty cool. I mean, there's there's been over 10 million meals donated across the United States through Cisco. So that's really how we work through the process. And uh, you know, we, um, we're proud to be part of that. Um, that I saw process. many of those pop-up retails and I thought that was fantastic. I, I think Lazy Dog is still selling eggs and uh, bread. Yeah, you know, um, you know, uh, what a great example um, that, that they have been, um, you know, they, they uh, pivoted, so, since you brought it up, they did a great job pivoting to this temporary environment. And, you know, one of the things that, that you know, the advice that I would give, and I mean, you, 
the past is the past. There's nothing you can do about it. But they were able to quickly transform from this temporary takeout situation right into, uh, you know, uh, dine-in service, even with the adjusted um, statuses. And as each one of the counties opened, they were ready to go. And you mentioned this earlier, Greg, the, um, the, the signage uh, that was uh, critical, um, you know, that people did so that people know that they're open and the perception. And, you know, I get to speak as a, as a, as a customer as well. I mean, you know, I've, I've been out um, right away going into different restaurants in different communities just to see what's going on. And, and um, you know, um, you mentioned kind of three types of customers. I'm probably more on the, the eager side and, you know, not just because of the industry I'm in, but um, just because of my past and my love for it. Um, it's, it, I'll tell you the number one thing that I've seen first and foremost, which I would apply to everybody that's on the webinar is the enthusiasm and the excitement from the locations I've gone into from the employees. So the first thing that I would tell you is the amount of work that you're doing beforehand with the employees that are gonna greet the customer is critical. And I mean, greet the customer in all, all levels, not just the, the first person that they see, but um, right. setting those expectations. But that's been, that's been exciting for me to see. People, uh, employees were genuinely excited to be there. Um, I'm sure there's been challenges getting some of them to come back um, we all know about some of those hurdles, but um, um, that's the first thing that I would say, Greg, that I've seen. Yeah. Definitely. Leaning back a little bit more to supply and to inventory, um, as you were canceling orders and holding back from uh, growers, um, have you experienced loss of suppliers on your end? Do you see... Um, shortages coming in any particular ways that would be different for restaurant owners to understand. I mean, we've all gone through, you know, romaine spoilage and, and, and shortages for different reasons on romaine, but um, from all the produce down to the proteins, do you as a wholesaler see any, any particular market being affected deeply? Yeah, you know, so um, that's a great question, and it's a pretty, it's a pretty broad question too. So, um, yeah, yeah, it, and so let, let me let me kind of hit it this way. Um, uh, you know, because media gets a hold of these things, uh, and uh, which is important, you know, to 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 get the communication out there. But we all hear it a little bit differently. So one person hears something about meat plants, and they think that we're not going to have any meat uh, available, um, and some different things. So, you know, it, it's. Um, the challenge in the industry really has been more around um, not supply and product, right? There was almost, you, you, you've read these things about farmers, uh, you know, tilling uh, fields underneath and having excess yeah. dairy and, yeah. and, and uh, cattle. So there's still cattle out there. The challenge is really has come to the production and the ability to produce. And so as people weren't pivoting to certain volumes, certain facilities um, shut down. So it was more personnel based than it was product based. And so that's what we're seeing going forward. Um, I, I can tell you that it hasn't been difficult to bring inventory back into our facility, but there are isolated spots. And I'm certainly not going to name any you know, individual supplier or different things, but certain yeah. things will have challenges to come back online more just from getting themselves back up to speed. So in general, do we have beef, pork, fish, poultry, produce? Yes, we have all those things. And, and I'm sure most suppliers do. What I would um, advise people to do is to work with their supplier and make sure that they're communicating. Um, the example that I use, and this one might be a little bit more short term because produce, a lot of produce can be recovered much more quickly. Um, but if somebody's buying a case of avocados a week from us today, and then they want to buy 30 cases tomorrow, you know, we need to be prepared for that. We've seen it in retail, right? I mean, you know, we saw it with toilet paper, right? You know, toilet paper was going just fine, but then all of a sudden everybody needed, you know, three cases of toilet paper and it was gone. So that same kind of communication is really critical, no matter who your supplier is that you're working with them. Um, I think suppliers across the board are doing a great job of getting back up to speed and they'll be able to communicate um, where the challenges are. And so, um, you know, 
I'll just use beef as an example since there's been so much in the media. Um, it really is more of a production opportunity and some things have skyrocketed um, because they were more retail oriented, things like ground beef or um, chuck cuts and things that you see more retail oriented. And some of the um, center cut type products have actually, some have started to drop. And so we're going to have this kind of mix of business as we work through our new normal. Frankly, there's probably been some opportunities for some restaurants to maybe even upgrade where they were on their menu um, versus going the other direction, which is kind of interesting. But lastly, on that point, just just be fluid is, is the recommendation that I would give. We have to be fluid that from time to time there are going to be some challenges on some product, but, you know, there's not one area that we're concerned about, Greg, you know, in particular. That's good. That's good news. If I could ask a question, Please. I just wanted to touch base with the, uh, you were talking about pop-up shops where they're selling various products in their store uh, out of their restaurant as an alternative to straight takeout. Do you see sure. that in from your perspective as something that is on the rise, on the wane, even keeled? For those people that didn't jump on it early, is it something they should jump on now? That is a, gr that is a great question. Um, and I would tell you uh, kind of uh, yes to, <laughs> to like everything you just asked there. Um, in general, what we saw is uh, uh, certainly people that were doing pop-up shops were uh, obviously having significantly more success um, than people that were not because they were obviously generating a new revenue stream for themselves. Uh, and what we're seeing now from many, not all, but from many is they're starting to open. And of course, I, I can speak from visibility around the country as well, because other places have, have gone at different rates, um, that a lot of people are continuing to, uh, to do these uh, uh, pop-up retail type environments. It's just, you know, to me, I kind of look at it, it's another version of takeout, right? But they looked at new opportunities and new things. And I think one of the confusions for a lot of people around pop-up uh, they heard pop-up retail and some people viewed that as, you know, I was turning into a grocery store. And what we were really encouraging a lot of people to do was look at the items that you have in your facility and what could you get out there. So people were getting really creative. You know, if you had a, a taco shop, you didn't have to become the local grocery store, but there was a lot of different products that you could sell. And if you wanted to uh, throw in toilet paper and paper towels and trash bags, you, you could, there were other options, but people were selling different items and making family kit meals for people to prepare. I mean, you know, one of the things that we're seeing out of this, you know, across, you know, outside of the food service side is that people are cooking at home and doing some different things. So why not be uh, a supplier of those products to help, uh, you know, the, the end user, because, you know, that's been the biggest shift, right? The industry had become 50 50 between you know cook at home or uh you know dine out type of an environment or even slightly higher to dine out in our society it obviously reverted back with the closures so we're going to need to work as an industry to help get that back by supplying uh you know the end user with other products so a uh, great question and um I, I know that i would absolutely be doing it if i was an operator in some form depending on my uh, my right. type of location I have a question, if I may. Sure. So speaking of the new norm that we all hear about and from the supply chain side, what changes do you foresee happening on the distribution side going to the restaurants? Do you see changes in minimum orders, either, either increasing them or lowering them to help smaller restaurants? Uh, frequency of deliveries, are they going to be longer? Are they going to be shorter? Uh, are you going to go from, say, six days a week or seven days a week to four days a week? I'm trying to get a feel for sure. how, how a, a distributor, obviously, like yourself, is going to approach that. Sure. Uh, another great question. Um, so I think what you saw um, pretty quickly across the industry, excuse me, was um, the reduction in delivery days was the first thing. So we're uh, a six-day-a-week, excuse me, a six-day-a-week delivery um, distributor. Um, uh, most of the people that are in the same vein as, as, as my company, uh, our company, are in that boat. And most of us uh, pivoted down to a uh, four-day-a-week uh, delivery. Um, you know, no different than uh, most of the people on this uh, webinar today. You know, we're running a business here as well. 
and uh, you know we had to be efficient and effective um, and, and work through the process. So what we are doing here now, and I think you'll see this pretty much around the um, um, the industry is we're pivoting back. Um, you know, we've announced that uh, on the 20th of this month, we're going to go back to six day a week uh, delivery, which is exciting. A lot of customers are excited for that as they're starting to rebound. And so I, I think that that's what you're going to see. Now, as far as um, sizes and volumes, um, you, you know, no real change to where we are as far as, you know, where we run our personal minimums. You know, every company's a little bit different. Um, what I would encourage people, and I think this is what a lot of uh, you will get from this crisis, uh, and this is what I talk about, that silver lining and no, you know, don't, don't let a good crisis go to waste, as horrible as that sounds. You know, what did you learn? And, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people will learn, you know, when you're running an effective um, uh, business in this industry, you know, people tend to get more deliveries than they need. And, and we always talk about storage and space. So how are you adjusting your menus? How are you doing the things so that you don't have to get as many deliveries? Um, uh, you know, and, and if somebody needs six day a week delivery because that's their kind of volume, no problem. I mean, the distributors can do that. But I would encourage people to really look at, you know, their menu and their business to see, you know, how they're doing those types of things. But you know, the new, the new norm will be, there will be some similarities from a distributor standpoint. I mean, I think you'll get back to the same caliber of uh, availability and deliveries to answer your question. Um, but I think people, including uh, companies like my own, need to be smarter about how we go about it, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you very much. Yeah, good. Yeah, great question. Brett, I hear a lot from restaurant tour clients that I'm consulting with that say, I, I get, I save money uh, by getting my own supplies, going to some other unnamed sources to collect my weekly orders and get my prices down. Can you uh, address for us the um, benefits of using a wholesale supplier to deliver to you that maybe nickel, dime, dollar more uh, for the same product, but I guess what, what's the answer? What's your answer to that? Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, and, you know, great questions today, uh, guys. I appreciate them, uh, and and they're broad. I mean, they're they're big ones, and you know, you're hitting a button for me that is. Yeah, I'm pretty passionate about and, and it really stems from where I started in this industry. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I went to culinary school and, and you know, one of the first things I remember learning in this industry is it, it's not a nickel and dime industry, right? It's a penny and nickel industry. And, you know, the, the, the profitability margins are so slim um, and it's no different for um, uh, the distributors, even the distributor the size of ours. We, you know, we have a large volume, but our margins are typically lower than that of a restaurant. And so, you know, what I would say to everybody is nobody got into the restaurant business or this type of industry to save money, right? People got into this business to, to, to make money and it, it's their career and their craft and their passion. And so, you know, there's a time and a place when running to um, the store, we'll just call it, um, you know, there's an appropriate point. I mean, I, I had to do that at a point in my career when I was starting a business. But what you'll find is it's been proven over and over and over statistically, um, uh, mathematically, that the time away from your, your business will create far more cost or challenges than having product delivered safely would be the key word that I would tell you. Temperature controlled, the right products getting it consistently delivered to your, um, your restaurant, your place of business. Um, I mean, food safety for us, that, I mean, that's the number one concern for us. Number one, um, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's going to be the number one piece, but just the time away from your restaurant and the time, you know, people think that, Oh, I like it. It's a, it's a break. I could go on and on, you know, when the, when the cat's away, the mice will play. I mean, there's, there's a, there's an advantage for being present in your facility when you're there. Um, yes. and, and focusing, right? Yeah, and keeping the order. Yes, absolutely. Hey, can I pick back on that? 
Greg, can I piggyback on that? Yeah. Just, just real quick. I mean, I, I don't work for Cisco. I've never worked for Cisco. I work with Cisco as well as all the other vendors. Um, but a lot of people don't realize all the additional things that Cisco brings to the table. And I've learned over the last few years how they, and I'm going to probably use Brett's terminology, is they work on a consultative service where if you're a client um, of Cisco's, a lot of people don't realize their kitchens are open to you to do research and development. They will provide food for you to do research and development. They will work with you on costing out your menu. They have business development people. They do training seminars. And all of this is at no charge. And the other piece of what you guys were talking about is owners don't realize your time is valuable. So look at if you're going to pay a few dollars more possibly for a delivery from, um, from Cisco or another distributor versus you going out and not getting paid for shopping five, six, seven, eight hours a week. What could you do with that time to build your business? And a lot of people don't realize that's, that's time you could be networking, driving sales, training, um, working with, with everybody involved while Cisco is bringing the food and your items to you. And again, I don't think a lot of people realize the consulting assistance that Cisco provides. Yeah, Steve, I mean, I, I appreciate that. And, um, um, you know, I'm pretty passionate about what I do. And again, I'm trying to really approach this from a, from an industry standpoint. So I, I appreciate that. And so, um, we, we do offer a lot and, and, and other people do as well. And, um, you know, the only thing I would say is I encourage uh, people to, to, to go to our, our foodie.cisco um, website. You don't have to be a customer to even look at the resources that are available. And if that's something that you're interested in, that's great. But um, there are a lot of resources. So from an industry person, um, uh, go, go through and take a peek at that. You know, from from the consultative side, Steve. I mean, that's that's exactly what our team does. Um, you know, I'll just kind of go back to that original question that Greg asked. You know, going to the store and let's just put a fictitious number in. And if I went to the store to purchase a thousand dollars worth of product, and um, I thought that I was saving ten percent by doing that, just to grab a number, that's a hundred dollars. And if it took me um, uh, if you're buying a thousand dollars, I don't think you're doing it in an hour. It's probably two hours, but say an hour or two hours to your point, Steve. Um, and this may sound a little bit funny, but if I spent two hours or one hour, just walking around and putting flyers on neighborhood doors or cars near my, my, my restaurant, which made me sound a little bit old school, but I'm just trying to make my point. Do I think that I could generate more than a hundred dollars of profitable revenue versus the hundred dollars that I saved shopping. And that's the point that I think you're trying to make, Steve. And Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I think we all, we all do it. Sometimes we, you know, we cut off our nose to, uh, despite our face because we, we do what we think is the right thing. And it's hard to step back and say, hey, I'm gonna spend uh, you know, $5 more. Um, uh, you know, but you really have to look at it from the big picture. And so I, I appreciate the comments that you're, you're bring, that you're both bringing up. I have a real quick story. I did two run out once in a while to stores that were close by to grab things we were out of. And one time I needed to go get arugula. So I went to a specialty grocery store in our complex and bought them out of arugula. I wasn't chastised by the 18 year old checker for buying them out of arugula or paying too much money. She pointed out to me that I was ruining the ruining the uh, the uh, the environment by buying 16 plastic containers of arugula, and I should have got it from my wholesaler in one open flat. And I thanked her for the advisement, and I said I I wouldn't buy that again. I, I apologize. Everybody has their own perspective on that. I appreciate your comments, Brett. They're right in line with the way I think, and uh, I think Cisco does a, a fantastic job with all of their services and partnering with the restaurant stores. So. Uh, Appreciate to, to avoid turning this into anything other than a panel discussion, I want to move on. Uh, we've gone through our time now. Um, 
we talked, did we hit everything? Pricing, yes. New supply team, yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to open it up to questions. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There we are. Go back. Anna, do we have any questions for the panel? Yes. Oh, so awesome. First one is, can you elaborate more about the city's new rule on opening outdoor spaces, parking lots slash streets for dine-in? I think we can. Does anybody want to speak to that or should I open? Well, I'll, I'll make a quick comment on it. I mean, everybody's got a, a different version of it. I mean, right now, LA has what they call El Fresco. Uh, that, that they've signed off on. And Laguna Beach, for example, has just had the city council sign off on closing one of their main streets for traffic, for restaurants to be able to use the outdoors for, for tables. Uh, and I think it's a it's a city by city ordinance, a city by city issue. Uh, in fact, there's another one now that I believe is charging, I think it's $140 fee or something to be able to get the approvals. Uh, but it, it's kind of all over the place right now. And I think it's up to each individual to contact their local uh, uh, council to find out what their rules are. But it's certainly a great opportunity to increase the space. I think I think uh, not only not only you give you more revenue, but I think it's very important though to remember that when you do set up the outside dining, make it nice. Uh, make sure you have it cleaned on a regular basis. You have to have a person that's being designated to take care of that area. And but you need to make it inviting so people will actually want to use it. Uh, whether you've got umbrellas or whatever, so it's nice and comfortable. Uh, and also let them know that there's going to be social distancing out there as well. So it's important to remember all the basic guidelines, uh, how it sits your restaurant, and, and also make sure somebody's monitoring it out there and, and have the, make sure you take care of, of their garbage and let them just leave it and you take it with you and you trash it in a bag and gloves and everything else with that. So yeah, We identified early on that patios were going to be the golden spot. They're outside, they're in the fresh air, perception of safety. Everybody wants to go to the patio. And I think that these programs are outstanding. Lake Forest has come up with that um, application process to view you on an individual basis and make sure that the area you're gonna use is gonna be safe, that it's gonna be level, um, and, and that it, you can use it appropriately. And I appreciate the comments, Mark, because keeping it clean and keeping it bust up and, and visibly sanitized is gonna be the first thing that people see from their cars as they drive by. So um, I think that uh, outdoor dining is, is key and I'm glad to see the cities are stepping up to do that. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'll elaborate on that one more, a little bit more on that. I think it's also important to realize that though you're open for dining inside the restaurant, you don't have to have dining outside. Uh, it can be a, a curbside, takeout mm -hmm. so you're offering a spot for them to eat their food that they're getting from curbside or takeout and so they don't have to wait to get home to eat it so i think that's important also uh, when you start wanting to have orders taken out in the parking lot sometimes that creates some difficulty yes. uh, with the ordering process and delivering the food process even though you're probably going to get it delivered just like it was takeout so it might be a good thing for you to think of it as a curbside and takeout use for people to instead of having a tailgate which some people are in the parking lot anyway Right. They have they have the ability to sit there and eat their food while it's hot out in front of your restaurant or in the back of your restaurant. Yeah, I would definitely piggyback on that and say the whole logistics of payment, treating it as takeout dining rather than just a table that you're serving outside and doing your normal check presentation at the end of the meal, mm -hmm. treating it more as takeout so that they pay pre prepay. Yeah, throw in throw in pitcher of margaritas, you know, have have that available, you know. While you can serve alcohol on the patio with ABC rules, you might as well yep. take advantage of it as much as you can. Absolutely. But I, I, when, when we were talking about this earlier, guys, in the planning stages, Mark, you mentioned walkouts. And certainly a street side patio table is, is a prime area of weakness for walkouts or the dining dash class of, you know, entities. So, I, I love the idea of, of them having curbside pickup and please use our, our street picnic area or whatever. I love that. Hey, Greg, one last know, point on that would be something that you can secure or remove at the end of the day so that overnight your tables are not just sitting out there and somebody comes up with a pickup truck and has a new patio table for their backyard. Right. Right. You had a question? 
Yeah, well, I just was going to add one other piece, and you've probably covered this on uh, some of the other webinars, but, um, you know, the other thing we've learned for sure right now is social media is king. Um, you know, it already was, I mean, look at what we're doing right here, right? We're, 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 people have become very virtual. So um, what you're getting out on your social media is critical. So, you know, if it's this outdoor dining, you know, it's obviously local restrictions apply, but, you know, what you're putting on your social media demonstrating what you're doing. And so you see the cleanliness, you see that there's dining, you see that there's these different things available. I mean, social media is king right now. So that's something that if you weren't part of uh, that process right now, you better believe it's real now. And you certainly are because you're on a webinar. So uh, it's, it's, yeah, that I'm so glad you said that. That is absolutely critical for people to take advantage of social media. It is their opportunity to market to their entire customer base. All the changes that they've made, it's safe. Come on back. You can trust us. Yep. And I think that what you just mentioned, Brett, is absolutely critical. Now's the time to use that and let people see what it looks like now and encourage them to come back and let them know how pleased you are to have them come back. So very good point. Thank you for that. Yeah. I see two questions in there uh, in the chat box. Uh, one is, please explain how to do pop-ups if you're a brick and mortar. Um, a little bit further ex explanation, they're a bit confused as to how it works. And the second, uh, if you could, Brett, tell us the link to Cisco again. Uh, the sure. Yeah, sure, no problem. So uh, first, the link is, is uh, real easy. It's, it's foodie, uh, F-O-O-D-I-E dot Cisco, S-Y-S-C-O uh, dot com. And so I'm sure it'll come up. Uh, a lot of information on there, so I'll leave it at that. Um, and then as far as the pop-up, yeah, you know, I think this, this was some of the confusion because um, I'm sure most of the people on here, you are brick and mortar um, type of uh, opportunity, unless we have some, some ghost, kitchen, uh, ghost kitchen people on here. That's another hot new trend. Oh, yeah. uh, but uh, the brick and mortar standpoint, uh, the pop-ups were really just about taking the space that was in your facility because it was shut down and turning it into a frankly, more like a retail type uh, situation um, where people could come in and, and do that. I mentioned that some people are keeping it depending on how you're rearranging your restaurant and space. Some people have carved out areas to continue to do that. Um, some people will not. There was also what we called a pop-up shop type event, which was different than kind of the retail. Retail being something you did in your, your, your restaurant Kind of brick and mortar and then the pop-up shop was a scenario where people were taking orders for product and having people order it in advance through their restaurant so maybe you made a family meal kit or you uh you have a a, a bread item or you you uh sell steaks or what have you and you put together a list of items or heaven forbid you wanted to help try and sell toilet paper uh, you put these list of items together, advertised it probably through social media and whether uh, uh, um, avenues you had, and then people placed those orders in advance and came down at one day during a certain time to pick it up. And those were both uh, two wildly successful uh, scenarios for restaurant tours. So the gist of it is basically treated as if you're a specialty shop. Like there's an Italian one in uh, in Upland that is great, all sorts of specialty Italian items. But long story short, put together a list of products, determine whether you want to sell it online or in store, price it appropriately, and then are there any limitations in terms of what people would sell in that manner? Well, I would obviously you got to follow any any local rules and guidelines, and so you yeah. know, I mean, what was fascinating for me to see was, uh, uh, and I'll just offer an opinion. You know, I was excited to see the avenue the ABC went down and, and how they relaxed some of these rules. And I mean, that was really a, a, a blessing for a lot of people to be able to do those things. So, uh, and fortunately, it appears like things were safe around that. Um, so, you know, I think the limitations are only uh, as far as you can go in your mind and your, your ability. And then, of course, from a legal standpoint, for me, when it comes to, to menuing and, and all these types of things, it, it's always been the four, four P's is what I've always talked about. And I think this is what people need to look at right now. When you talk about your, your items in your business, because they're all different, um, popularity, pr 
profitability is probably the first thing I should say. Because again, you didn't get in this business to save money. You got in it to make money. So profitability, popularity, preparation has changed. You, you might have less personnel now. And then today, portability, right? There's so much to go business. Um, you know, those are the four P's that I think you really need to be looking at uh, in today's, uh, today's industry. Mark, you had uh, quite a bit of success uh, with your shop doing, um, uh, I'm trying to remember, it's so long ago, Easter, Mother's Day, and that kind of stuff. Oh, you're still muted, Mark. Uh, I think it's very important to uh, you know, try new things, and I, that's what we did. But we've, us being a prime rib house, um, we came up with the idea that we could serve half a prime rib in a family packs with the cream yeah. corn, cream spinach, and offer that up so people are taking an actual half of prime rib already cooked home, ready to do, they can still carve it at home. So it's, it's, uh, it en enables them to uh, have the experience and have good food and not have to worry about the mess and also the cooking of it and logistics of all that. And it leaves you more time to be with your family and such without having to worry about that. There's only one person that has to suffer and that's the person that has to come and pick it up. <laughs> but, you know, maybe they can have a cocktail while they're waiting or something. Yeah. But, uh, but, and we, and we did not, we did not curb back on the price either. We, we kept the price pretty much the same, yeah, this uh, yeah. which, which is, you know, it has to be profitable. Like you were mentioning, Brett, it has to be profitable for us to do it. So we didn't cut the, we didn't cut the down our profit margin on that at all because we're still offering the same product. So it, it worked very well for us on Mother's Day and Easter, especially. Uh, Father's Day, we're going to do it again, even though we are dining in now, but we're still offering the curbside. The family stuff is still popular because people are still in that cautious area, especially if you have an older clientele base. Awesome. Do we have any other questions, Hannah? No, those are all the questions we have. Okay, I have one. How far should we go into this reopening? Is it more important to focus on practices and procedures rather than construction and reorganization? It's a good question. I think that people are seeing the expense of reopening and trying to understand what they're gonna do after COVID-19. Now we know and we pray that there's an end to COVID-19 and don't know when that may be coming. Um, recent events have told us that it's going to stick around for a little bit longer and maybe get larger. We don't know. Um, I think this is an excellent question based on the fact of your investment and what you're going to keep after COVID-19. You're going around installing beveled glass partitions at a high expense between your booths. Um, if you're buying more furniture, if you're, if you're certainly buying lots of plexiglass, that kind of thing. What is your budget on that? What is the result of those actions and what can be kept after you're done? Um, mm -hmm. Are you remodeling your kitchen or are you changing equipment because of the low staff levels? Are you moving and combining stations? Is pantry next to, you know, in front of grill now so they can turn around and run both? What are you doing in those capabilities that would do that? So I think that you need to focus on your procedures because you're building a new brand and your procedures and you're retraining your staff to operate in a different environment. So trying to um, make structural changes to your store, make sure that those structural changes are beneficial going forward uh, in your new operation. Yeah, I think it also depends a lot uh, on what your capacity is in your restaurant. If you're a very small restaurant and you can only do 50% occupancy, right. it's going to be tough for you to be able to make, make the kind of profit that you're going to need. You may need to do some kind of barriers for you to be able to open up as much as possible, but mm -hmm. you have to be the one to judge that depending upon your own individual restaurants. A lot, a lot, of, a lot of different sized restaurants out there. Yep. And, and that goes to street parking too, street parking or street entertaining, street paper. If I could pitch in as well, I think this brings up the, the whole concept of the, the, as we've called them, the three buckets, the three waves of, sure. of people coming back. I think we're going to prep up or, or a lot of people have already established 
rules, procedures, things that they want to do. Uh-huh. However, the first group in the door are going to be those with the highest risk levels. So it could be very easy to become complacent and suddenly realize, well, I don't need all these paper menus or I don't need this or I don't need that and just dispose of them. Mm-hmm. As we get into wave number two, those people who are uh, optimistic but aware of what's going on, their risk level is lower. And then once we get to that last one, which are, are very cautious, they're going to come out and they're, they're finally coming out of their, their caves that we've all are our home caves <laughs> come back into reality. And suddenly their liability and risk levels are much, much lower. So it's potential that those that are very litigious will be the last people out the door. And if you become complacent with wave one and two, it could be an issue for you. Yeah. So I think this all goes with the planning. It all goes with it, looking at the numbers. We asked in the first week, what have you done for projections? What have you done uh, at profitability at what, you know, 40% of sales, 30% of sales, 50% of sales? What have you done? What have you budgeted in your cash flow that you can afford? You know, do you want to spend money on a monitor for menus? Do you want to spend money on paper menus? What is it that you can fit into your operation? So. Hey, Greg, yes. I, I would just, I didn't hear this one mentioned, uh, something that's been very popular that we're seeing more and more, and it's uh, very inexpensive to do and cost effective, is the QR menu. So a lot of people are, you know, getting those little boxes where people just scan them on their personal devices. They don't have to throw anything out. They can adjust them. They're ready to go. And I mean, for the most part, who doesn't have a cell phone today? But, you know, it depends on your clientele, but very popular now. That's one of the other questions that I had down here. I didn't know if we're going to get to it or not, but I have added numerous technology apps for the customer. How do I educate them on how to use them? What if they cannot use them? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll just, uh, what I would just say is that, you know, the QR things, you you obviously have to get the QR code out there somewhere. So um, whether that's a, um, uh, a table tent that the, Um, server brings to the table to show them how to get into it or get to their thing or if it's on a bar counter or a countertop scenario it can be taken away it can be sanitized it can be visibly sanitized it can stay on the table just be sanitized afterwards some different things but that has become um, what I think a lot of people were very concerned about Uh, a QR reader sounded so technical and you know I can barely turn on my own phone yeah there's people that you can reach out to just go on Google and look it up or, you know, go to your suppliers and they'll support you with that stuff. It's very yeah. economical. And I think it also goes back to the ambassador we talked about in the early, earlier conversation. If you have somebody that cannot, and I know that's my parents. Um, it's sometimes me. A lot of the times I'm reaching to my 14 year old daughter to say, how do you do this? Um, it's amazing. Um, but I think that that ambassador takes over that position of education. And this goes to our opening topic, the direction, the, the escorting, the, the handholding virtually, of course, that goes on with your customer to help them get through the situation, maybe learn something and say, hey, that was really neat. I love the QR because it is a reduction of contact in many different areas, including if it has the ability to pay your check. And when, when they pay your check, they capture their email. So you're capturing customer information for touchback as well. So um, virtual touchback, no touching the customer. A great hey. point. Yesterday I was at a yard house and I used the QR code, Brett, to your point, and it was just slick as can be. Didn't have to touch anything. It was beautiful. Very, very simple. Really clean. All right. Yes. Love great that. idea. Well, we've come to our time, Mark, and I think that, uh, Hannah, do you have anything else? Uh, Nope, that's it. Um, I do want to promote, though, tomorrow we are having a webinar about no contact menus and no contact technology for your restaurant. Um, So I put the link in the chat box. I will also put it one more time if you guys would like to register for that. Um, And then join us next week for our next topic. Sounds great. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Brad. We're for much more for coming in. Thank, Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, Brad. Thank Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Have a good afternoon.
You too. Care. Care.